Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. For the last several months, terror activity emanating out of the West Bank and leaking into Israel proper generated manhunts and preventative operations by the Israel Defense Forces, leading to clashes with armed individuals and cells, especially in and around the cities of Nablus and Jenin. Further south, East Jerusalem is a hotbed of friction between residents and the police. How tense is the situation in these sectors? What is the Israeli government and security forces' policy in handling it? And could the sensitive time on the eve of the parliamentary elections see a conflagration into full-scale raids on the scale of the 2002 Defensive Shield campaign? Joining us from central Israel to deliberate these matters is Colonel and Reserve Miri Eisen, who is a TV7 Powers in Play panelist and as well as an Israeli public diplomacy, security and intelligence expert at ICT at Reichman University. Thank you for joining us, Colonel. Shalom. Also joining us from another location in central Israel is Colonel, a retired Colonel, Dr. Iran Lerman, who is a co-host of TV7 Middle East Review, as well as a Powers in Play co-panelist, uh, the JISS VP and Editor-in-Chief of the Jerusalem Strategic Tribune. Thank you for joining us as well, Dr. Lerman. Thank you. And with me in the studio, as always, is our TV7 editor-at-large and host of Watchmen Talk, Powers in Play, and so much more, Mr. Emil Owen. Emil, give us uh, somewhat of a timeline and a broader understanding of the current state of play within the context of this latest escalation. So, Jonathan, you uh, mentioned uh, two uh, ostensibly separate entities, the West Bank, or Judea and Samaria, as it's called in Israel, and East Jerusalem. Now, um, up until uh, 1967, or between 1948, 49, and 67, uh, this was uh, one entity under Jordanian rule. After uh, Israel uh, captured the territory, it annexed the eastern part of Jerusalem, adding it to the western part, which uh, it has held and uh, which uh, was its capital. And um, the uh, residents have been given uh, Israeli uh, papers as residents rather than citizens. They can uh, uh, participate in municipal elections, not in the Knesset election. But obviously, they see themselves as part of the Palestinian people, no matter uh, where they reside. And these are two different phenomena. One in the West Bank, especially in Nablus and uh, Jenin, um, is a sort of a counter-reaction to the Israeli counter-reaction to the terror acts, which, um, as you said, emanated from these parts and leaked into Israeli cities, towns, roads um, around springtime. March earlier this year. Earlier, earlier this year. And because Israel cannot only play defense, it went in uh, trying uh, to uh, find the perpetrators and uh, their helpers. And this caused some clashes with the uh, residents of Jenin and Nablus and the refugee camps around it. And one thing led to another. And here we are uh, some six months or so into a campaign against the terror activity there, which is um, sometimes inspired or even directed by Hamas or Palestinian Islamic Jihad based in Gaza, not in the West Bank. The other uh, part of the uh, uh, riots, um, the um, disorderly conduct, is in East Jerusalem. And there, there are um, religious uh, reasons. Also, many Jews, a quarter of a million Jews, live in various uh, parts and neighborhoods of uh, East Jerusalem. Some of them new, brand new, built by Israel. Uh, in those areas, there are no uh, Arabs. But some other neighborhoods are in the, next to the old city, in the eastern part, where Jews used to reside before 1948 and uh, have come back to, to live there, and the neighbors uh, have not uh, put out a welcome party. Same people who actually fled in 1948 from Jaffa and elsewhere and ultimately found their way 
to the locations which Jordan designated. Well, some, some people were what you just described. Some found uh, new homes there. Uh, it's um, inter mixed, intermingling there. In any event, uh, because East Jerusalem is sovereign Israeli territory, it is not the Israeli defense forces, not the military which operates there, but rather the police, including the border patrol. And sometimes there are different tactics, and uh, the upshot is that Israeli television screens are full almost every night with one incident or another. Some uh, could uh, take place in roadblocks uh, between the West Bank or even some of the uh, neighborhoods of Jerusalem and other parts, and some in the West Bank uh, uh, proper. In any event, because you mentioned the parliamentary, the Knesset uh, elections, obviously the Israeli government has to weigh whether it wants uh, to conduct uh, a more extensive operation whose results will not be seen immediately, but the cost will, and uh, could uh, uh, harm the prospects of the governing uh, coalition, um, short of a very, very uh, tragic and costly incident um, because of a terror act, one tends to believe that there will not be such an operation prior to November 1st. Indeed. Colonel Eisen, I'd like to uh, ask you particularly, uh, we call it, of course, Operation Wastebreaker, Shavil Galim in Hebrew. Uh, it was launched following the deadly terror attacks uh, in March of this year, which uh, uh, Emil just uh, mentioned. These terror attacks, even though one was from the area of the Mishulash within Israel, northern Israel, uh, two terrorists uh, uh, emanating from there, perpetrating uh, a deadly attack uh, with uh, sympathies, of course, to uh, the uh, Islamic State, at least from uh, their uh, perspective. Another uh, sympathizer of the Islamic State emanating from the Bedouin villages down south. And then we have uh, a couple of terror attacks from, indeed, Janine Nablus, uh, who was not necessarily affiliated, but had uh, backing and to a certain degree also intelligence indications uh, regarding uh, being funded by the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, an Iranian proxy. Israel then enters uh, the Janine area, Nablus area, northern Samaria, and starts rooting out terror elements, particularly initially affiliated with the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, the Iranian proxy, and then expanding that also to other organizations uh, to the degree where we see those terrorists with their backs against a wall starting to lash out to other areas, starting to leak to other areas, and then, of course, with a vigorous social media campaign by the Islamist Hamas organization, by the Palestinian Islamic Jihad organizations in the Gaza Strip, trying to fuel hatred in social media uh, to really encourage the youth, the Arab youth in Israel and the Palestinian youth in the West Bank, to go out and attack Israelis and Israel at large. What can you tell us of the, the development and what should we truly be concerned about? Jonathan and Amir, usually in these descriptions, I'm sitting, I'm agreeing. I'm, um, today I'm slightly disagreeing on the overall framework in which we're presenting this, and that will be my response to how I view this. Um, we are 20 years after the harshest of the Second Intifada, meaning that the youth in both the West Bank and East Jerusalem and in the Gaza Strip, by the way, also inside Israel proper, that youth that can be 15 years old or 20 years old, or for that matter, even 25 years old, does not remember the Second Intifada. That's not part of their background. It's part of their parents' background. Now, 20 years after that harsh reality, where the Palestinian Authority itself, using its weapons, using its structure, decided and chose to go to war against Israel, that's the story 20 years ago. The youth that's doing it now, and I want to change a bit of the way that we're framing it. I want people to understand we're talking about 
teenagers. We're talking about people in their early 20s. We're talking about people who do not have that memory that for the last 20 years, from their point of view, nothing has changed to the good within their arena, not within the West Bank, not within East Jerusalem, let alone within the Gaza Strip. And in those changes, when they look around, they're looking for something to inspire them. So you said Hamas inspires and sometimes funds. Palestinian Islamic Jihad inspires and sometimes funds. I view this as being an enormous youth um, in, in other cultures, in a horrible way, this youth may have gone to gangs. They may have gone to other negative elements. And in this case, they are looking for an outlet for their anger, for their anger at the heads of the Palestinian Authority within the areas they live, for their anger against Israel that they see as responsible for everything. And that anger is coming out in a way that I'll define as terror, but it's not necessarily in the constructed terror organizations in the way that we knew in the past. I think that Israeli intelligence capabilities are exceedingly effective against the terror organizations, against the Hamas infrastructure, against the Palestinian Islamic Jihad infrastructure. And we are not as effective when it comes to disaffected, disenchanted youth that get their hands on hot weapons and do acts of terror, but not in a constructive sorry, constructed terrorist way. And I see that as the big challenge right now because it is very broad in the Northern West Bank and it has the potential to spread much further. Dr. Lelman, uh, Northern West Bank, Northern Samaria region, that is the focus of uh, Israeli operations. Also, uh, a loss of governance from the Palestinian Authority that right. has prevailed for quite some time, uh, ultimately bringing about uh, a lash out uh, against the Palestinian Authority and also Israel for that matter. Uh, what can you tell us about that? Well, I, I, I think, first of all, I agree with Mir that we are looking at a new phenomenon, um, by the way, to some extent fueled more than ever before by the social networks, um, the, the need to demonstrate bravado on, on TikTok. I mean, uh, people have been talking about the uh, Ukraine war as the first TikTok war, and uh, and uh, Arin al Usur, the lions, then comes across as the first TikTok terror group. Um, it, it's it has much to do with the need to to demonstrate uh, action. So that's one factor that has been, uh, I think, driving this this new dynamic. Um, I also agree with your last comment that um, the failure of governance on the part of the Palestinian Authority is particularly acute in, in northern Samaria, um, further away from, uh, from Ramallah uh, or, or from Hebron, where there is, uh, is still quite, a, a, I would say, an authoritative uh, social structure. Uh, and uh, that the corruption, the, this, let's say, the growing delegitimization of the Palestinian Authority, of the Fatah movement, uh, um, older leaders, as the younger ones drift towards greater and greater affiliation uh, with the terror groups, all of this adds up uh, to uh, um, what we are seeing now. I would not uh, uh, dismiss also, the role of Iranian money and Iranian incitement and, and, and uh, uh, let's say, this uh, um, infrastructure of support, uh, mainly through the proxy Palestinian Islamic Jihad, uh, which is stronger in these parts, in Janine and to some extent in Nablus than elsewhere uh, in, the, uh, in the West Bank. The Iranians have an acute need right now for a variety of reasons, uh, for Israel to be distracted from its uh, campaign, uh, from the campaign between the wars which Israel is con conducting against the Iranian position in Syria, and Israel's um, rumbling uh, warnings that the uh, action may be coming at some point, or needs to be coming at some point, against the Iranian nuclear project. So the Iranians have a vested interest as Ali Khamenei wrote already in November 14 in turning the West Bank into another Gaza and the one opportunity to do so is in the north. 
So all of this could have led to another operation like the one in which both Miri and I had a role uh, in the, uh, on the, uh, let's say, on the information side, uh, namely Operation uh, um, um, Defensive Shield back in 2002. But there are two differences. First of all, that was triggered by a horrific failure uh, of, the, of the Israeli uh, forces until then to prevent massacres, real massacres of, of citizens in our streets. Operation Breakwater, on the other hand, has actually uh, done its job since March, uh, uh, since the short wave of terror that we saw in March, there was a, de a clear decline in the effectiveness of penetrations into Israel. There was one bizarre case in which a lady, an old woman was, was butchered by a Palestinian who later hanged himself. It was just clearly a lone wolf bizarre episode. Penetrations, effective penetrations into Israel otherwise have been very, very mm -hmm. limited. Let me uh, respond with a disclaimer first. Uh, foreign correspondents are notorious for uh, flying into a city uh, taking a cab into town, chatting it up uh, with the cabbie, and then filing home a story based on what they heard from one individual uh, cab driver who may have been planted by the host government in order for them uh, to get the impression. So the Israeli equivalent um, is not a cab driver. It's a painter, a handyman, a construction worker from the Palestinian territories working in Tel Aviv uh, or elsewhere. And they will tell you that, uh, yes, what we heard from Miri and um, Iran is correct, but the uh, uh, result is that they are indifferent. Those um, more elderly Palestinians, not belonging to the cohort uh, which we uh, talked about, are indifferent to what happens in the Palestinian Authority. For instance, uh, only a few days ago, Hussein Asheikh, uh, uh, Abu Mazen's number two, was in Washington and uh, met with Wendy Sherman, uh, Blinken's number two. And for the Americans, uh, this is a signal that while they have not been able to reopen their consulate general in East Jerusalem, they are conducting uh, affairs of state with senior Palestinian officials. But for the uh, Palestinian in the street, could be a Tel Aviv street, but a Palestinian residing in the West Bank, Hussein Sheikh is another corrupt official of an incompetent authority. Um, he is not going uh, to be uh, supported by the masses. Uh, they, they believe that there will be a struggle between various security organizations and among themselves, and uh, some of them against Hamas and Palestinian Islamic uh, Jihad. So it is not only a delicate time regarding the Israeli political scene, but also the Palestinian one. I'd like to focus on two points that uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, or sorry, Dr. Lehman has mentioned, and the, the first one is the name of the new organization, the Lions Den, uh, which uh, is a new uh, Islamist terrorist organization, so to speak, uh, that operates currently relentlessly uh, and tries to promote as much as possible um, uh, its own activities as uh, those of leading uh, basically the Palestinian street. And the second one is the fact that uh, ultimately when we look at it, uh, the, the money fueled by Iran and other organizations enables uh, much of this. Uh, but uh, let me focus particularly on one thing, and uh, Colonel Eisen, I'd like to hear your uh, point on this because I, I've been speaking with people in Janine and in Nablus and, and on a regular basis and also outside of their uh, areas adjacent. And one thing came um, back to the same, basically, conversation, and that is that uh, Palestinian Islamic Jihad learned from Hamas, which is trying to also return to its root, becoming civic organizations, trying to uh, bolster the, the youth, bolster the families that are lacking very much because of this lack of governance of the Palestinian Authority, and therefore also enables those organizations with malign desires and aspirations to influence the youth and also, of course, the, the Lion's Den then 
provides an umbrella for all those uh, men, uh, young men mostly, who are part of Fatah, who are part of those other organizations to then disguise themselves and operate within a new umbrella, which is not funded by the organizations uh, which they're affiliated to. Is there a certain complexity in which this issue can be resolved at a time when it doesn't seem that in the street proper, anything is truly changing? Not only is nothing changing, Jonathan, when I think of the youth and when they look around and go, who are the figures that I want to emulate? What is what I want to be like? And they look around in the Palestinian Authority, they go, God, we did not want to be like all of the other corrupt Arab countries that continue to be corrupt. We don't want to be like the Assad, but for that matter, they don't want to be like the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan or Saudi Arabia either. When they look around, they don't have any kind of example where they say, that's what I want to be like. And when they look around with their young, and as you said, the youth, I call them young, angry men. By the way, we should say young, angry people. I think there are a lot of angry women as well, just within that society. They're not allowed as much to be out there, but I I worry about that coming out also. And within that aspect, it's who is going to inspire them. And for a moment, I just say, it's a question that we've been asking for over a decade. Where is that Arabic speaking figure? Islamist type of figure that inspires people to look for something with the future, with the hope, rather than with a machete or with a gun. And it's a big question, and I don't see those alternatives. What I see is going after that Iranian harsh type of look, or for that matter, the Arabic speaking Hezbollah kind of challenge where money flows in and it brings in different things, much more of a mafia kind of way, and I don't see alternatives. And as you said before, what happens to part of the population is that they just don't care. But with the younger generation that are out there in social media, they live that same kind of social media life that so many of us, you know, it's kind of behind me. It's what my kids do. I can't say that I live it. And I think that it very much impacts them into going out, being on the street, being part of what's going on. And what's going on is anger, is anti, is attacks, and to have it all posted on social media as quickly as possible. Well, uh, uh, taking the the Abraham Accords Uh, out of the equation, peace culturally in the Middle East is not a popular word. Mr. Owen? No, just regarding the alliance then, the um, uh, shoulder patch of Israel's uh, central command is a lion. Um, In the north, you have a a gazelle or a moose, and in the south, you have a fox. But um, Israel was there first with lions, and it will probably find, find... a lion tamer because the military which managed to find its way to Entebbe several thousand miles from home can get into Janine or Nablus without causing collateral damage. The, the whole thing is uh, to be laser focused on these uh, several wanted perpetrators without others uh, dying in the clash funerals and this vicious circle. Operationally speaking, uh, without a reason of a doubt, it's, it's pretty impressive what's happening there uh, from an intelligence-driven uh, perspective. Okay. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Mm-hmm. Lerman, as we don't have very much time left, but I'd like to bring Jerusalem into the picture. There is a roaring trend in which uh, the, the backlash of tensions in the West Bank are not necessarily fueled by the local Arab residents but rather by radical Jewish figures who are seeking to capitalize on the situation and then uh, somehow capitalize in the upcoming national elections, uh, which are just around the corner. Uh, What can you tell us about that? And is there a true answer to this, since there are also a lot of hate-driven youth in Israel who are seeking retribution for what is happening supposedly in the West Bank? Well, quite frankly, um, we've had uh, past incidents in which just close to an election, uh, uh, attacks by Islamist elements seem as if they were designed, I cannot prove it, of course, but they seem as if they were designed to um, enhance the um, hard right in Israel and basically 
just generate deeper and deeper hostility rather than, um, let's say, capitalize on the, for example, the, the recent message by Prime Minister Lapid that he still believes in the two-state solution. It is almost as if they want the, uh, the kind of reaction from uh, uh, hotheads on the Israeli side to reflect their own, uh, their own hostility. And there are elements which respond to this. Uh, um, the, uh, the, the polls are indicating a rise in the popularity of certain elements. In addition, uh, it's, very e it's easy for some uh, elements on the Islamist side to latch on to utterances by a tiny minority of Israelis, really a negligible, crazy fringe with people who talk about rebuilding the temple on the ruins of the existing mosque. These are uh, uh, basically the police is monitoring them. The, uh, the their role is negligible. But in the world of uh, of uh, a flat world of uh, instant media attention to every every crazy idea that floats about, uh, even the the news that somebody brought a red heifer to Israel is enough to stir up trouble. Uh, so I would uh, uh, caref I would say that this is a major challenge, not only to the, for the police and for the security services, but also for the infrastructure of, of mutual interest that Indeed. has been built painstakingly between the, uh, the city hall in Jerusalem and the government of Israel and key elements within Eastern, uh, uh, Eastern Jerusalem society, the Makadisiin, who have a vested interest in economic and social integration in Israel. It requires a, a very intelligent and careful handling. I hope that even in the heated atmosphere of a pre-election period, uh, these can be found. There are many developments, of course, at hand, and every little anecdote, and this is something many people also abroad don't understand, every little anecdote impacts the peace here in Jerusalem and throughout of Israel. But unfortunately, this is all the time that we have for today. So I'd like to thank uh, Colonel Eisen, Colonel Dr. Lerman, and Mr. Oren for being part of today's panel. And I'd like to thank our viewers as well. And we will see you next time.